Great. Uh, hello and welcome to this uh, second uh, seminar uh, series on uh, water resources and dams. Um, this has been sponsored by an um, RCUK project called Design and Assessment of Water Energy Food Environment Megasystems, and that spells dams. Uh, and um, that's a, a recent uh, global challenge uh, research fund, GCRF project, that has started at the University of Manchester. It's led by the Global Development Institute, and it has uh, also a very large representation from um, University of Manchester Engineering. And in the context of this project, we'll be inviting a series of exciting uh, speakers from around the world uh, to look at uh, water resources and energy and environment and food. Um, and so tonight, uh, today, we're very pleased that um, um, we have arranged a, a fantastic international speaker, and uh, he's an economist. And so um, we ha will have our very own Dale Whittington, who's professor at UNC and also at the University of Manchester. He's also an economist, and he will introduce the wider context of this talk, and he will introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Michael Hanneman, uh, personally. So no further ado, here's Professor Dale Whittington. Cheers. Thank you, Julie. Um, I, uh, thank you for coming. I, I'm impressed that you found the room, given the announcement was wrong. So thank you uh, for being here. Um, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Michael Hanneman uh, today. Uh, Professor Hanneman uh, actually uh, grew up in Manchester, in Didsbury, uh, right down the road. Uh, he did his uh, uh, BA at Oxford, uh, and then his master's uh, at the London School of Economics, and then went to uh, Harvard, uh, where he did his PhD in economics and never returned. He, he uh, to the UK. He, he went uh, uh, to Berkeley and had an, uh, a very distinguished uh, career in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at uh, Berkeley, where he did pioneering work in uh, non-market valuation on both theory and methods. He's a recipient of of uh, many uh, awards. Um, uh, Mike Gull and I uh, met in uh, 1974. Uh, that's a long time ago. So you never know uh, when you're a graduate student who you will meet. So if you're a graduate student here, you know, pay, <laughs> pay attention to your colleagues. They may be famous someday. Um, uh, uh, I'm a great admirer of Professor Hanneman's work. I mean, he's most known for uh, 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 theory and, and methods innovations and uh, uh, water resources and non-market valuation. But what I'm, I particularly admire about uh, uh, his work is that he uh, pays great attention to practice. He's an economist that uh, worries about institutions, uh, legal frameworks, hydrology. Uh, so and that, that's almost unique, and I think it makes him, in, in my mind, the preeminent water resources economist in the world today, um, because it's not just theory, although uh, it's, uh, he's, uh, he's been a giant in the, in the theory and methods field, but it's, it's his uh, focus on reality that, that really distinguishes him from uh, his other uh, colleagues. Um, in terms of our own uh, work today in the DAMS uh, 2.0 project, his uh, title uh, and his, his talk is particularly relevant. Um, why is economics so hard? Because in the uh, uh, world of uh, constructing and operating dams, we need to be guided by economics, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard to capture uh, uh, the, the water economics, and Professor Hanlon will, will talk about that today. And the same thing's true uh, for those of you in, in uh, 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 Duncan Thomas in my class on uh, uh, water policy in, de in developing countries. Economics does need to guide um, uh, investments in uh, uh, improved water and sanitation services in developing countries. Uh, but it's very hard, and, um, uh, and so again, uh, the topic is uh, uh, very uh, timely. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Professor uh, Hanneman today, and I, it's, it's very special because this is the first time in over 50 years he's been back to Manchester and gets to see uh, the transformation in this city. So thank you so much for making the effort. Well, uh, it is a, a great uh, pleasure um, in many dimensions. Um, to be here. I left in 1963 when my, when my family moved to London when I uh, went uh, when I was an undergraduate. And I've uh, never come back. And boy, Manchester has changed. Not just, I mean, changed since 1963 so dramatically. 
Uh, I want to say the uh, qualities um, Dale ascribed to me uh, as admiral are uh, shared by Dale, and I have the same admiration for Dale and his um, work as an economist. And I think the similarity of interest is, is why we have um, uh, kept in touch and worked together. We've been working together for 15 years um, now on water rights for the Hopi tribe, which is the oldest, but one of the poorest uh, Native American tribes. Um, you know, Manchester has um, certain things in common uh, with uh, California with regard to water, not the climate. But uh, Manchester was the scene of the first major uh, environmental engineering project, the, the project to bring water from the Lake District in, I think, the 1860s. And uh, it turns out that was the first controversy of environment versus development, environment uh, versus economic role in um, modern European history. Uh, a book has been written about this by an American historian, Harriet Ridwell, the first uh, conflict between sacrificing the natural environment in order to permit economic growth. And California has been, is the site of major water projects and controversies about the need to um, develop new water supplies for San Francisco in 1908, um, uh, uh, for Los Angeles in 1908, 10, 19, 11. So both places have different climates, but um, have fought over the need to build water. Economic, uh, water economics, as a field in economics, flourished, certainly in the United States, in the 1960s. Major books were written, leading economists worked on that. The context was California's debate of whether to expand uh, the uh, water project that brought water from the northern part of the state, which is, um, uh, has a lot of rain and is rural, to uh, uh, farming in the central part of California, the most valuable farming in America, and to Southern California. And uh, the, the, so uh, economists argued in the 1960s that um, Rather than uh, investing in new infrastructure, we should better manage the water resources that we have now, rather than expanding. Uh, we should price water and use it more efficiently, and not uh, invest in major new supply. That debate was lost, and the economics literature in the 1960s took place in the shadow of that debate, but after the political decisions had been made. They were made by the father of our present governor. Uh, and our present governor was both the youngest and is now the oldest governor in uh, California history. And I'll uh, come back to him later. In, in, in economics, uh, water economics stopped being of interest. Energy economics took off in the early 70s and became a huge field. And it's only, I would say, in the last five years or so that, energy that water economics is beginning to have a resurgence as a field of interest in economics. Graduate students now are finally uh, writing dissertations. I had the uh, wisdom and foresight to move into water economics just as it died, <laughs> and not to move into energy economics just as it began to flourish. Uh, but if you wait long enough, <laughs> you catch things. So, uh, whoops. So uh, my theme is that water has physical, um, legal, and social characteristics which make it very difficult to uh, analyze uh, and to manage as a, a commodity. I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. And what I want to stress is these are these are problems not only in poor countries which lack infrastructure, but in rich countries like uh, the US, like the UK, with existing infrastructure which is now aging, which is very expensive to uh, uh, upgrade and expand. Um, so th there are underlying problems 
uh, of features of, of water that create difficulty. And those features are, uh, are found everywhere where water exists. It's like um, an illness which is found in poor people as well as rich people, is found in history as well as uh, in contemporary society. Some of the details play out differently, but it's the same uh, uh, underlying problem. I'm going to go through, uh, the first is above all water is heterogeneous. You can't talk about the price of water, uh, the price of a gallon or an acre foot of water. Water has different value to people at different times of the year, at different locations, with different uh, quality, uh, um, whether uh, what sort of property rights uh, comes with, what, what claims other people have on it. And so it's meaningless to extrapolate, to say, okay, uh, somebody paid $1,000 for a million gallons of water here, I'm going to take uh, $1,000 as the value of a million gallons of water. Um, it's not like you want to buy a share in Marks and Spencer, you look at the Financial Times, you see the price of a share, you call your broker, you say, that's what I want to buy. Those are standardized commodities. You want to buy a pound of butter, it's a standardized commodity. Water, above all, is not standardized. Above all, water is what I call an entangled commodity. Um, uh, and it's entangled for at least three reasons. That is to say, if you own and wish to use uh, a unit of water, a gallon of water, just think, if you own a, a plot of land, you can put a building on it. Now, it's true the, the town council will have building codes, there's a height limit, but within those restrictions, you can build whatever you like and you can do whatever you like. Again, there are restrictions, maybe you can't run a business in a residential structure, but basically, if you want a home with five bedrooms that are small or one bedroom that's large or whatever, you, you can do that. By contrast, you can't dispose, you can't utilize a gallon of water any way you feel uh, fit. First of all, uh, in agriculture, you'll generate returns flows and uh, folks downstream will have a claim of some sort on those return flows. Uh, you may uh, contaminate the water in some manner, uh, and so uh, there's an externality from uh, the pollution. The, uh, you're taking water out of a stream which provides aquatic habitat, which is an ecosystem, uh, and you may be harming uh, native species of fish. Uh, the, uh, where water is stored, like uh, is in a reservoir, well that uh, is used not only for water supply, but for flood control, for recreation, and as, and as habitat. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a host of externalities. The second thing, and, and because of these features, is that in most places around the world, the legal property right to water is different than the property right to land or other assets. And in particular, um, the, the state or the public or other people have some sort of legal claim and legal interest in your water. It's not your water in the same way that it's your land or your house or your coat or your clothes or your car. You don't own it unconditionally in the same way. And the third feature which clouds property rights is if, particularly with surface water, surface water is typically, because of economies of scale, collectively supplied. There's an infrastructure, a dam, a reservoir, an aqueduct, a pipe system, which serves many people. You can't say, this is my house, these are my, this is my water, I should be free to sell it, or whatever, because you're part of a pipe system and uh, everybody else on that street has paid for the pipe system. Uh, and so you don't uh, own it. Uh, you can own your piece of land with far less entanglement than you own the water flowing into your house. So um, two people can, you can't have two people owning land for the purpose of building a structure. Only one person can have a structure. And, and so to a much greater extent, land is a discrete resource uh, than uh, a volume of water. Compared with electricity, water is easy to store, 
hard to transport. Electricity is hard to store, but easy to transport. The networks along which water and electrons flow are different. You have a grid. A grid serves many potential producers of electricity, many potential uh, consumers. It really is a network. Water typically is one supplier, one location of supply. Uh, serving a particular set of users. There may be more than one users, but, the, but because the grid, uh, because a, a, a water aqueduct is much, has far fewer branches than a, a, an electric grid, and so there are far fewer people at the terminus. And typically, uh, uh, water conventions are not common carriers. Uh, uh, Manchester built an aqueduct to convey water from its source to Manchester. Uh, and that's not a common carrier in the same way that the UK electricity grid uh, is. Um, one result, because so economists obsess about pricing water correctly and using water transfers as a substitute for building new supply infrastructure. So the first thing to say is water transfers are not like the sale of electricity or the sale of land or of any other uh, commodity. Uh, as Joe Sachs, the great American environmental lawyer of the last 50 years, said, water transfers are more like diplomatic negotiations because it's not just one buyer and one seller, it's that many parties who have some sort of property interest who have to be satisfied or, or silenced. So, because water uh, can be used by multiple people for multiple purposes, because over time new uses develop, so in California, uh, water was originally for uh, uh, hydraulic mining, for washing away mountain sides to get at seams of gold in, inside the rock, then for agriculture, then for cities, uh, then for uh, in-stream uses, for recreation and so on. Water, uh, new, if, if you look at water use over history, even within a metropolitan area, uh, you, you know, water use in LA, water use in London was 50 gallons per capita per day uh, in the 19th century. It's now maybe double that. I know in LA it was, uh, in America, water use per capita in, in cities generally is about 200 gallons per capita per day. Some of that's industry, but not all. People have, people have fancier lawns, they have swimming pools, they uh, do more stuff with water in the home. New people, pe new people come along and people find new uses uh, for water. And so conflict is uh, endemic uh, because you have the people who were using the water originally and then you have the new people or, or people find new uses. And the question is, how does that work out? I, so I, I'd argue that conflict is endemic to water um, uh, throughout societies. And resolving these conflicts is a politically fraught uh, problem in most cases. So uh, let me, uh, uh, I want to give you an excerpt from an op-ed written, uh, so California had an extremely severe drought in 2014, 15, and 16. And this is a Stanford labor economist. He served as a chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the first Bush administration. This is in the Wall Street Journal, not known for its subtlety and, and nuance. Spouting off, shortages are generally caused when governments place ceilings on prices or when they prevent markets from operating freely. If people have rights to water and others will be willing to pay, why sh what walks trade? And the answer is governments get in the way. Uh, so California has a morass of regulations that uh, restrict the export of, of local water to other communities out of the area of origin uh, laws which prevent the export of water from county, particular counties in California. There's uh, a, a permitting process, there have to be environmental uh, assessments, they have this, the State Water Resources Control Board is the State Water Rights Agency. I had the experience of serving as their economic staff um, over about a five year period. And so I have a sense of what things are like on the inside, he continues. 
even if the state approves a transfer, uh, uh, environmentalists have successfully sued. This was a conflict between two federal agencies, the Bureau of, of um, Reclamation and the um, Fish and Wildlife Service. So what he says is this, this is written at the most severe drought California had experienced, the most severe three-year drought. And he said the solution is for the government to step aside, get out of the way, and then let people uh, let, let the farmers, whoever owns the water, sell the water. And if you are so worried about environmental restrictions, fine, pay for the water for in-stream flows. Just have a market and the market will take care of things. Well, <laughs> first of all, the farmers don't own the water. In fact, no individual owns water in California. The water is owned by the people of California. And water users have a right to use the water, not to own it. And, and that right is conferred by the state agency, which uh, 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 Professor Lazar wanted to step out of the way. And under California's uh, law and constitution, the right, uh, a water right, can be retrospectively declared invalid uh, if it violates what's called the public trust. Uh, environmental regulations took off in America after the 1970s and they have invalidated certain water rights which were acquired legally according to due process before uh, uh, that time. Um, so uh, the water rights are clouded and I'm going to come back to that. Another major feature, complicating feature of water is it's variable. Uh, it's variable in location and it's variable in, in timing. And the, the, the issue with water is essentially getting water at the right location at the right time with the right quality. And California is a prime example. S uh, Sacramento is the capital of California, but it's in the northern part of the state. Two thirds of the population in California lives south of the capital, south of Sacramento. Two thirds of the precipitation occurs north of Sacramento. The people are not living where the rain is. Uh, also, the time of the year, two thirds, uh, uh, 70 percent, uh, 75 percent of water use occurs between April uh, and September. That's when most of the agricultural use occurs. That's when in cities the largest use occurs for lawns, for watering lawns. But 80% of the precipitation occurs between October and March. The water comes at the, at the wrong time. Stream flow varies. The average stream flow is 71 million acre feet. It varied from as low as 15 to as high as 135 uh, within a, a six year period. Um, so, Precisely because the flow is variable from year to another, there's a strong incentive for water transfers. You have uh, farms, you have uh, fields with crops planted, you have uh, factories located, you have homes located. If suddenly you go from 71 million acre feet to 15, this is, this is a, a problem. Uh, the variability of water supply is endemic. And some sort of transfers would be a natural solution. There's also the question, which I'm going to come back to, is there an obligation to share water at the time of scarcity? And the answer is, in some religious codes, and in, 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 in many uh, 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 ethical codes, yes. So, and this is just a quote uh, from uh, a legal uh, making this point about the contrast between property rights to water versus those uh, to land. The property rights to water um, are limited and uncertain. And I'll come back to the uncertain in a moment. So I want to uh, talk for a few minutes about property rights to water in America. Um, and some of this, most of it won't apply to the UK, but some will. The following. You have to distinguish between the right that you, as a resident of Manchester, have to receive water from the city of Manchester versus the right that Manchester has to take water from Thirlmere. 
the ladder is an abstraction right. The majority of the water users in England, in, in America, uh, have rights only to receive from a water supply agency. Those are matters of contractual law and government law. Those are not water rights. I say this because many, many people confuse them or take them as the same thing as water rights. They're not water rights. They're rights to be served. They're legal mechanisms uh, uh, through which you could uh, take action if the service agency fails to provide service. That, those are part of commercial law. Have nothing to do with uh, water law. Uh, in uh, America and in many other countries, groundwater comes under a completely different uh, legal regime than surface water, even though the same user may have access to both and may be using uh, both sources, even though water projects, water <coughs> supply projects, may commingle water from both sources, they're separate legal rights. And as I indicated, the right to water is a right to use the water, uh, not to own the uh, water rules. Now, in America, the, there are two major forms of uh, water rights. The riparian right, which comes from English common law uh, and was taken over when the, uh, America became independent uh, and is the basic uh, water law of the eastern states. And then another type, which I'll get to in a moment. The key point about riparian is that uh, riparian rights are like the rights of tenants in common, of people who share a house but don't individually own parts of the house. The, uh, the riparian right is a right um, from, uh, of the landowner adjacent to a stream to take water from the stream and to use the water on the land adjacent to the stream and not elsewhere. So riparian rights cannot be traded Riparian water can be used by anybody who has riparian land, and everybody who has riparian land has an equal right to use that water. I don't mean is required to use an equal amount, but has a, a right of the same standing. And uh, there's no dispute mechanism other than litigation. If I, th we're both riparians, and I think you are taking too much water, I'd have to sue you. And, and suppose I win, my suit would bound you, but not anybody else who was a riparian, unless I chose to sue uh, other people. The riparian doctrine works in practice where you have lots of rivers, where you have lots of water. So there's a high chance that uh, the uses, that someone who wants to use water will want to use it on riparian land, so uh, the riparian doctrine works. When Water use started on a significant scale in California. It was to, for hydraulic mining. And uh, the land in California was, was public land, not privately owned. And the hydraulic mining wasn't on riparian land in, in many cases. And so there was no legal way to get water, to take water, and to use it for mining. And so the, uh, the miners created a new water right. Uh, known as the appropriative water right. And the appropriative right is a right of first possession. By taking water, you get a, a right. The date at which you start taking water determines your seniority. If there's not enough uh, water for everybody, those with senior rights take their full amount, and those, uh, when you run out of water, those with junior rights are completely cut off. It's a completely unequal system of sharing. It's first come, first serve. Um, and with variable stream flow, as I say, the more junior people get completely uh, uh, cut off. To perfect the right, you have to start diverting, and you have to, have be, you have to then prove you how much uh, water you've uh, diverted, then you have a right. And uh, any disagreements are resolved through litigation between whoever wants to disagree uh, with whomever else. So the first point to note is both types of water rights, these are the two types of appropriative rights in the West, riparian and uh, I mean, originally, going back uh, to the 19th century when they were conceived, uh, both of them are not self-enforcing. 
they, uh, they lack an enforcement mechanism. The way you got an appropriative right was in order to get an appropriative right, you needed to divert water and you needed a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. And on the piece of paper, you would write your name, the date, and the amount you expected to divert, and you would fasten that piece of paper to, uh, uh, to a stick which I think had to project three foot above the ground, or you could fasten it to an adjacent tree. And that was the only record to mankind of your water right. And it's unfortunate, but let's say in California where it does rain in the winter, pieces of paper eventually get washed away uh, and with them the record of your water right. Uh, so the unfettered appropriative right makes no sense. Very briefly, and this is a digression, everybody says, and it's true, the, the appropriate right was copied off the right to, um, to uh, explore for gold uh, by surface miners in, in California. You wrote your name on a bit of paper, you placed a bit of paper on a stick where you were working your claim. Um, and, but there were crucial differences with mining which made the system work for mining but not for water. The first crucial difference is spatial contiguity. If Dale and I, if I'm exploring here and Dale is there and I start encroaching, he'll see that because we're physically uh, contiguous. With water, Dale could be extracting water 100 miles upstream from me and I'd never know he was doing it. He'd never know I was doing it without a central record. You, you wouldn't see that. So a system of note, of putting notes on, on uh, trees worked for mining, but not for... Also with mining, the, the mining thing, with gold, they weren't mining, they were exploring for traces of gold. And in maybe only 1% of the locations would they find gold. What, so uh, you came, you looked, you, you, to see if there was evidence of gold, and you moved on. And in fact, within five years after, if you hadn't worked a claim for five years, you lost it anyway. The aim with mining was to get places explored. Not for, not, uh, the, the right wasn't uh, production in that sense, because if we were neighbors and Dale wanted to produce and I would, we'd, we'd consolidate and do something, because of economies of scale, we wouldn't have uh, separate uh, mines on, on our little patches of, of land. So this was, a, this was not about extracting the resource, it was a, about searching uh, for evidence of the resource. And with miners, they had a conflict uh, mechanism. Uh, there were what are called mining camps. These were social institutions in mining areas where the miners gathered. And um, if Dan or I uh, disagreed it's true, one or the other, might, one of us might shoot the other. But generally, we would go to the mining camp, present our claims, and the mining camp would adjudicate. There was no such adjudication mechanism built in uh, to water rights. Uh, very briefly, eventually, eventually, states created a different method. You had to record a claim with an administrative agency. I contrast here Colorado and California. Colorado got going and has the most organized system of water rights. California still has the least worst system of water rights uh, in the West. So uh, 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 large-scale diversion of water started in uh, Colorado about 10 years after it did in California, also in the context of the mining discovery. The first step was to eventually create an administrative agency. So instead of putting bits of paper on trees, you filed a claim with a, uh, with a bureaucratic agency. Colorado did that within 20 years. California didn't get, didn't get to do it till 2014, 60, uh, I'm sorry, 1914, 63 years late. When this registry system was set up, at first they grandfathered pre-existing rights. They were not subject to review, the new rights were. California, uh, uh, Colorado removed the grandfathering entirely by 1919. California has not yet removed the, Arizona, uh, the grandfathering today. 
And uh, the other thing is having establishing some uh, administrative apparatus on the ground, having some guy going around checking whether water diversions were uh, uh, satisfied, complied with the water rights. Colorado and, and other Western states established such a system. California uh, still hasn't uh, um, got uh, such a system organized. Why? Why does? Uh, why has California not got around to regularizing water rights? My answer is opposition of water users. Because California started first, the water users built up political power. And they have succeeded in blocking these steps uh, that uh, would happened in uh, Colorado. Now, more generally, as I've said, new uses uh, uh, arise in water. So, Demsitz has a theory that property rights emerge when it's economically efficient, when the benefits uh, exceed the cost and not before. And that may be true or may be fantasy. But what I want to focus is on, when do property rights, how do property rights get reallocated when new users come along and new uses come along? And this is, uh, th there are two views. This is particularly relevant with climate change, because what is the moral relevance of an allocation of water rights? Uh, uh, 100, 150 years ago, based on a flow regime that no longer exists. And there are two views. One view, and this is uh, held by authorities in Colorado, is you stick with the original property rights and, and you have to deal with the future within the framework of whatever their rights have to be. An alternative notion is society needs to make some sort of adjustment to change circumstances. It needs to come up with a fair way of, of dealing. What was done in Australia in the Murray-Darling Basin is an example of this, and, um, uh, uh, and inconsistent with the first view. And this is an unresolved issue in, in the US, but I think in other uh, locations also. Very quickly, the cost structure of water is very problematic and distinctive. Most of the costs of water are fixed costs. The variable cost, the operating cost, might be 10 or 15 uh, percent. Marginal cost pricing, the marginal cost of supplying an extra gallon of water, is, is, is minute. From the, that's why water wasn't priced volumetrically in most places till around uh, uh, 1950, 1940, after World War II. Electricity was metered from the very beginning to long. Why? Because the marginal cost of an extra kilowatt hour it was significantly large. It didn't pay to meter water, that was the view, because the, the marginal cost was so low, the, the meter was way more expensive. So water wasn't sold um, on a volumetric charge. It was sold on the basis of how big your house was, or, or some, some version of that. It was all a connection fee not a volumetric uh, uh, charge. And so if you want to engage in marginal cost pricing, which is the kind of norm in economics, that's, that's not going to go anywhere. That's not going to raise anywhere near enough revenue to pay for the system. You need a more complex policy. Uh, not only is most of the cost capital, capital is extremely long-lived. And it's not reusable. It's in place. Um, you know, a dam, a reservoir, a pipe system in the streets, they, they can be 70 years, 100 years, 150 years. Uh, the system is not modular. You need a reservoir uh, in the Lake District. You need a, an aqueduct. You need a pipe system in the city before you can deliver a single drop of water to someone living in, in, in the city. You, the whole system has to be in place. It's capital intensive. You can't do it as you go. You have to somehow finance all this capital before you can deliver a, a single uh, a drop of, of water. And so financing is extremely difficult. You can't if you, you can say, make the users pay. But people are going to be using this infrastructure 100 years from now. And you can't make them, but you've got to pay for it now. Um, 
And you can't do it in a modular manner. So a classic example, this arose in the Ebro River project in Spain. It's been discussed. So in 2002, the Spanish government wanted to have a, a, a big diversion project, 4 billion euro project, to take water from the Ebro River and deliver it to the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Uh, from Barcelona to, um, I'm forgetting, the Murcia. And, uh, you know, this was massively expensive. They did a bogus cost-benefit analysis. They compared it with desal, and they argued it would be more expensive. Uh, total nonsense. Why? You don't have to build a desal facility that will last 80 or 100 years. Right away, you build the first desal plant. And then you can build a second and a third. It's modular. But a, a water a diversion project isn't modular. Everything has to be built. And so the time value of money uh, uh, bears down on that enormously. Now, another feature, water supply is fragmented. So for example, in California, five large utilities serve 80% of the population at the retail level with electricity, five utilities. Something like 200 utilities serve 80% of the population with water at the retail level. Uh, and in the UK, before the consolidation in the 60s, I think, water was massively uh, fragmented. Why is it fragmented? Because you can't have people living <laughs> at some location without a water supply. They would die after a week or, or two. Every place that has ever been inhabited, developed a, a, a water supply. Um, and these were inherently fragmented. And they remain, the, the pipe, the physical structure remains fragmented. So when electricity comes along in the late 19th century, you can build a network that will connect all of California. But you can't put in place a, a water network. I mean, it would cost a phenomenal amount of money uh, to uh, uh, retrofit the water network. So water systems remain massively fragmented physically, and in many cases, not in the UK, managed uh, in a fragmented uh, manner, in a consolidated manner. And also, by the way, in America at least, sewer management, uh, the sewer systems that are, that are more consolidated, but they're managed separately from the water systems. Different agencies have authority. Now, a couple more things. Water is a human right. There are well-established notions that water is a human right and that there is a moral obligation to share water in times of scarcity. In effect, there is something like a universal service obligation uh, for water. It has implications for, uh, for efficiency, which I'll get to in a moment. It has implications for the pricing of water. Uh, first of all, the notion that you should use price as the preferred method to ration water at time of shortage would be viewed as morally repugnant by both people. Now, an economist may wish to disagree, but it, that's not the point. Politically, that would be considered an outrageous way of, of managing uh, a drought. But forget shortage. There is, uh, Dale, like Dale and I both do opinion surveys, we do contingent valuation, uh, we have countless experiences of talking to people in rich countries as well as in poor countries about would, raising the price of water and would that, people object viscerally to that. People will tell you, I can afford, but it would be unfair to poor people in the town. There is this gut feeling that water should be kept cheap, way cheap. People accept high prices of beer and high prices of wine. They don't accept high prices of water. And so public systems, municipal systems in America are, are subject to relentless political pressure to keep prices down. The result is in rich countries, as well as poor countries, water is underpriced. And uh, the revenues are typically in rich countries don't cover maintenance, don't cover depreciation. In poor countries, they often don't cover the operation of the systems, let alone depreciation, um, because of this pressure to keep water cheap. Now, 
if you want efficiency. And, and, and why does one want efficiency? Because that you could uh, obtain the same outcomes at a lower cost. That's, that's the reason. Uh, uh, but uh, but r getting a, a more rational pricing of water is politically very difficult. And it needs to be done with, uh, uh, with considerable finesse and skill. In order to, um, economists talk about price signals, of using price to signal scarcity. The American movie maker, Sam Goldwyn, famously said, he was asked if when he made movies, he wanted to send a message to the movie going public. And his answer was, hell no. If I wanted to send a message to someone, I'd send a telegram. That's how many people feel about water. You want to send a message to water users? Send them a letter. You know, email them, text them. Uh, but uh, the notion that you are manipulating the price, not because something costs, but because you want to send them a signal, is a political uh, loser. And what I want to stress is, because water is so political, because people care so much for what will happen, in many cases, is you provoke a backlash and your economic policy fails because of the political backlash. The political leadership of the state intervenes to kill this because it arouses so much uh, opposition. What I've argued in California is, in order to get people to consider changing price, you have to start talking with financing needs. You have to lay out a case for what needs to be financed and frame it in the context of how do we raise money to pay for the things we need uh, uh, to pay. The last point, and this may seem odd, water is invisible in many cases. It's invisible to residential users because you turn on a faucet, you have no idea, I mean, unless you're an engineer, how would you know how much water you're using uh, right now? Uh, a factory may have a better sense. Either, uh, farmers may, but often water is un, uh, unneeded. And so one problem with pricing is if people don't know how much they're using, particularly if you have a, 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 some sort of uh, uh, scheme with increasing or for that matter decreasing rate blocks, if people have no idea how much they're using, how would they know that they could save money if they uh, lowered their use uh, uh, into a lower price block. That's the problem. This is something that can change and is beginning to change with text messaging. In elect and the same problem arises for electricity and electric utilities have, have now taken to text messaging for customers. Uh, oops, you're using, um, right now you're using a lot of water, it will cost X in, instead of Y. And that will slowly come to water. But without this information, the use of water is invisible, certainly to residential users. And the other thing is pipe systems. So if you look at the history, the installation of pipe systems in Manchester, in the cities, in uh, Western Europe, in America, paid for themselves. The water user paid. There was no subsidy. How did it pay off? It raised property values. How did it raise property values? Less fire risk and less uh, risk of disease. And this, so private enterprise wouldn't get those benefits. It required public ownership because the, the city government got the property taxes and they paid for the water system. There was no volumetric charging. It was all based on connection fees and property tax revenue. It's now 100 years later, more than 100 years later, pipe systems are failing. They're out of sight. No one notices them. No one notices anything until you have a, a main brain. Property values are not declining to reflect the aging infrastructure. And so it's not going to pay for itself when you fix the infrastructure. It's not going to pay for itself in terms of the boom in property. So, um, because of the strong emotional and ethical issues, you have to pay attention to distribution. The standard economic approach of focusing on aggregate uh, efficiency, that the aggregate net benefits, regardless of to whom they accrue, outweigh the aggregate costs, regardless of to whom they accrue, that, that, that doesn't work. 
Well, it doesn't work with many uh, economic commodities, but least of all does it work with uh, water because of the strong emotional and ethical concerns. So trying, uh, what economists do is they maximize aggregate net benefits as though they were advising a social planner who looked over all society and could make all the, there is no social planner, this is a waste of time. I mean, I don't mind if you do it, but I do mind if you base your uh, analysis, your conclusions on that. With wa water is political. Water has parties with interests. And you have to, they have to agree to an outcome. Or it's not necessarily a majority agreement, but there has to be a powerful enough coalition in favor of the change for it to be accepted. Otherwise, it won't happen. And so you need, to, so uh, the people, um, the, uh, you have to find a, a, a coalition that has enough clout to push something through that will support the program. And it's irrelevant what the aggregate net benefit is without that uh, coalition. Last couple of slides. So what I call the paradox of water is because water is essential for life, every human being ever, who ever lived in history had access to water. It may have been terrible. I mean, in many cases it was. For uh, maybe two billion people today, it's terrible. It's horrible. But, it's, but they have some access. And paradoxically, it turns out that I think many people value getting electricity in their home much less, or much more, than getting piped water in the home. Because electricity changes your life. If you, uh, at night, everything is dark. Uh, and it's a huge difference having light in the home. Not having to hike four miles uh, each way to carry water, you know, would be nice. It's not as big a transformation. And so I think for many people, the, their perceived value of water is lower than their perceived value of other amenities. So the challenge with water, and this is uh, my last slide, let me start with this. You can only get things approved, you can only make them happy if the people who, go, who pay for it see themselves as getting a benefit that justifies what they pay for. And if they don't, they will block you. Um, and so you have to find ways of, of making whatever the plan is beneficial to the people, sufficiently beneficial to the people who have to uh, pay for it. Uh, and the larger issue is we have water supply, we have uh, ecosystem projection, uh, you know, the wider recognition of the need to protect the natural environment, and we have climate change, and we have population growth. And balancing these things in a manner that preserves the resource uh, and improves the quality of life and maintains or improves the environment is extremely difficult. And the message I want to convey is th these are hard and simple formulas. Marginal cost pricing, have water markets, um, get government out of the way, are not appropriate. I'm, I'm not saying you don't need pricing. I'm not saying that there might be too much government interference. But I'm saying this is a very complicated commodity, and, and simplistic thinking about it is unhelpful. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Who would like to uh, start? Uh, 